All right, so uh, moving on with wireless, uh, chapter 18, wireless security and implementation considerations. Um, and again, just like with the, the previous wireless stuff, this is really broad strokes on wireless. Um, you're not going to more than likely be tested very uh, extensively uh, in depth on wireless stuff since there's a you know, whole other um, field of study for under the Cisco stuff where you can really, really go into this. Um, but first of all, understanding the threats. Uh, Three main ones covered in the book, uh, war driving, direct hacking, and employee ignorance. Uh, so war driving, um, term is derived from the, the 1980s uh, where they had war dialing, which is where you'd set up a, um, a computer to basically dial every phone number in your, in your area. You know, it'd start, try to dial, you know, well, I guess all zeros wouldn't be valid since that'd get operator, but, you know. One zero 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 zero. That didn't work. One zero 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 one. You know, just keep incrementing up until it's dialed every number. What it does though is like you know, some people are going to pick up, but on some of those numbers, you're going to get a response from a modem tone, um, and so it would uh, basically you know, you'd, you'd leave this thing running all day, come back later, and you'd find that you know you've got these numbers in your area that uh, have a modem uh, hooked up to it. And then based on that, you'd say, well, okay, I know where there's things that I can potentially hack are now. I'll go back later um, now that I know this information and try something a little bit more elegant as far as a hacking technique goes. So war driving is kind of along the same, the same uh, terms. Like um, basically what it usually entails is driving around town generally with an 802.11 device, an antenna, um, probably a GPS, and then usually software like Kismet or Kismac, which is specifically geared for this and then um, what that does is it helps the the hacker pinpoint wireless networks around the area so he can analyze them and plan for future attacks that that are uh, a little bit more elegant and actually do something besides just like discover your network and find out what kind of security you're using so once you're uh, you're done with war driving or the hacker is done with war driving the direct hacking kind of comes into play um, it usually involves breaking into the wireless LAN, um, breaking through the encryption and authentication, uh, gaining network access, and uh, scanning for network resources. Um, you can also decrypt data where a, capture, uh, a hacker captures uh, wireless data packets and reassembles if unencrypted. Um, otherwise, he attempts to de decrypt and reassemble. So, you know, say that you're, he doesn't necessarily have access to the, the network, but you're, you're trying to send a PDF across the wireless network on your, your, your company's um, wireless LAN, and he's able to capture the packets that, um, that, are can, uh, that contain that PDF. Well, if they're unencrypted, he can just, you know, reassemble them and potentially, like, put it back together and read exactly what you were trying to send. If it's encrypted, he can try to decrypt those packets and then subsequently reassemble to, to read the document. And then the, uh, the third type is the, uh, the wireless DOS attack, where it's just a denial of service to bring down the wireless LAN. Um, these are really more of an inconvenience than a, a major problem, and it's especially since the, uh, the attacker has to be within range of the, uh, the wireless network while doing this. Um, if it goes on for you know, very long, you're usually able to isolate what's going on and pro uh, possibly locate the, the hacker even. And then uh, probably one of the, the bigger ones is employee ignorance. Um, this usually happens after oh, an employee attaches an unapproved and unsecured wireless LAN access point to the existing wired LAN. Um, this ends up creating a, a really big gaping security hole to your private network that can expose your, your private network to additional threats because in most cases if they're hooking up an unauthorized rogue access point to your network, um, it's it may not have the best security methods. It may not have any security methods on it whatsoever. And so, as a result, anybody that um, gains access to that could potentially get access to your private network resources as well. And then uh, deploying a secure wireless network. Um, again, I keep stating this: CCNA only tests on foundational wireless topics, but wireless security can be broken into encryption, authentication, and detection. So starting with encryption, we've got um, three, three major standards that are covered. Uh, wireless equivalent privacy, uh, WEP, uh, Wi-Fi protected access, WPA, and then Wi-Fi protected access reloaded, uh, 802.11i, or sometimes known as WPA2. So WEP uh, was the first 802.11 security standard. Um, security standards for wireless really, really kind of came out half-baked because it, it was more or less a situation where 
uh, wireless uh, lands became available. It was such a, a cool technology that everybody had to get a hold of that um, it, it, people were basically deploying a lot of networks that, that didn't have like the best security practices and the security the security standards that were available at that time really weren't um, all encompassing. So um, you know, web, for instance, is rarely used anymore because it's it's very easily hackable. Um, so it's it's based on a pre-shared key system or a, you know PSK. Uh, to generate an encryption algorithm. Uh, the PSK has to match on both devices. Um, the formula is basically reversed to decrypt the data, so you have to manually configure it, the pre-shared key on both the, you know, the server and the client. And then, it, it, the, as I said before, it's not used very frequently. It uses a, a pretty weak, by today's standards, 64-bit encryption method. Uh, Web2 also uh, Web2 uses a 128-bit, uh, but is also considered uh, weak. Um, and then this diagram on the side, it's pretty uh, rudimentary, but basically, you know, you're taking your encryption formula uh, with your pre-shared key and applying that to whatever the clear text data is, and eventually you're going to get some kind of encrypted jargon like this that you have to uh, basically reverse the process on to decrypt on the other side. So, since WEP was so insecure, uh, 802.11 faced a crisis, and uh, better security techniques uh, most of the, or at the time at least, better security techniques required more powerful hardware than was readily available. Uh, so in 2003, the Wi-Fi Alliance released WPA as a solution, um, more or less a temporary one. It uses a temporal key integrity proposal, or TKIP, with 128-bit encryption, which would run over the, the current hardware. Um, it dramatically increased the number of encryption keys, um, so it, uh, it dramatically increased the overall level of security. Before I move on, um, as far as questions on the exam, I think um, with respect to this, I can almost specifically remember getting uh, questions like, which uh, which wireless uh, encryption method uses TKIP, or which wireless encryption method uses AES, or which wireless encryption method uses a pre-shared key. So being able to match up, you know, Web2 pre-shared key, WPA to TKIP, and uh, as we're about to talk about, 802.11i to AES uh, might, might actually be a direct question on the exam, potentially. So uh, WPA2 or 802.11i, uh, Wi-Fi Alliance in 2004, you know, so just a year later after WPA came out, released 802.11i, commonly called WPA2. Um, it uses the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. It's a very secure uh, algorithm standardized by the U.S. government. It's used in a whole host of things um, to, uh, for encryption. You can use it for IPsec, among other things, instead of, you know, uh, three dozen, etc. Um, it requires newer hardware, uh, but was also backwards compatible with WPA and, and WEP. So older devices that uh, didn't, you know, did not support WPA2 could still still connect while waiting to be upgraded. And this was considered, uh, you know, a, a big step forward uh, in general for wireless security. So uh, moving on to authentication, 802.1x uh, authentication using a, uh, a PSK a PSK or pre-shared key, key system alone has some shortcomings. Um, using the same PSK PSK for a, a long time increases the chance of it being hacked. Um, you know more opportunities for a hacker to get a hold of it, uh, just analyze it, that kind of thing. Uh, the pre-shared key has to be changed on both the server and all of the clients. So within networks of 10 or less devices, that's not a big deal, but if, uh, if you've got larger networks, it's simply not scalable. Um, and then pre-shared keys also don't allow for more granular control of network access on a per-user basis. So you know, if you have one particular employee that, uh, you know, say gets fired or leaves the company, you, they don't have, they're not using credentials uh, with just a pre-shared key system, so you can't just restrict their access uh, without changing it for everyone. Um, and then the, the industry responded with a, a great authentication tool, uh, 802.1x.